Hollywood, Los Angeles. What, yeah. what took you down to Los Angeles? I was doing the series of Quentin Durgan's, and in those days, if you do one series, you probably have to wait quite a long while to do another one. So uh, I thought, why not? Take a shot, go down. Oh, it wasn't quite that way, as oddly enough. Um, a producer had seen an episode of Durgan's, and an American producer, and it was around the time that Robert Kennedy was shot. And he, I, to him, I appeared to uh, look maybe possibly like a Kennedy look-alike, or a cousin, or whatever. So uh, down I went, and I, I played uh, the president of the United States in uh, Colossus the Forbin Project. And uh, Susan Clark, another Canadian, was in it. And we did it at Universal, took me 12 weeks and uh, doing the president, and then I came back. And it was that sort of, uh, that was pretty well the, the thing. I came back and, and then realized, uh, well, I can do both things. Some of the people around were doing them. Larry Dane, my friend, uh, uh, Al Waxman, they were jumping in their cars and going back and forth a lot. I thought, maybe it can happen for me. So I got some of my later calls uh, from while I was living in Hollywood. And they, they brought me up to do things. And how long did you go back and forth for? How many years? Five or six. Five or six. Um, I was writing. When I started to write, I left there. Because the stuff that I had done down there and the things that were, were sort of, there was a, the, one of the, uh, I think it was Screen Gems who called me in and talked to me about Durgan's. They said, uh, we're pretty interested in having you play a senator. And this was before the senator came on. There was one called Senator, Richard Crenn, I believe. And they wanted to take my same character, play it in American terms, and call it for Screen Gems. Anyway, it never came to be. And, um, I was spending uh, a lot of time then answering calls from Canada, you know. And who was your agent down there? I had four agents. Four? Yeah, yeah. I uh, changed them like shirts. I just, I learned, I learned about them quite early and uh, there was really, I had one called Bill Barnes and Bill Barnes was right out of the, the 30s. He couldn't wait to show me Spencer Tracy and Catherine Hepburn's driving, uh, like parking spots at MGM. And he put his arm around my shoulder. We stood outside MGM and looked at it. And he said, Gordon, there was a time when I could walk through the front door of this place. Well, that showed me <laughs> this man might not be the answer to my prayers uh, <laughs> for agents. Uh, Bill Barnes, yes. His favorite line was, get your paper and pencil. I thought, oh, this sounds good. And then he would say, take this down. And I'd start to spell out a name. M-U-R-R-A-Y-S-E-N-E-N-S. -S -E -E I said, yeah, okay. Uh, where do I go? Do, do, you know, I'm just, we were waiting for an answer from a Kirk Douglas movie or something. I thought this was the call. He said, well, don't you know? He said he was a friend of yours coming through from Winnipeg. <laughs> Those were the calls I would get, right? And were you sent out to the, the kind of grind through editions? Oh, yeah, I did a bunch of meetings. Oh, heavens, nothing but, you know. Um, I got a, a, a pilot with a script with, which fell apart with Debbie Reynolds as her husband. In one, and uh, she told me her whole story with Eddie Fisher. She never stopped talking, sort of what I'm doing now. <laughs> anyway, <laughs> she told me this entire thing about that, and uh, she said, "I have so I've seen you on screen, and uh, uh, how would how would you feel about all of this?" And I said, "Don't ask me why I said this, but I said, well, I really came here to do features." I said, "If there's." And suddenly, you know, I realized this is getting, and she got cool. And my agent dropped his ashtray down at the corner, <laughs> thinking I'd made the biggest mistake of my life. 
So that went on for a bit, and I ended up doing a lot of uh, the old shows, Canon, Hogan's Heroes. Um, you know, um, and was it in terms of ambition? Uh, or did, did you have the, the ego hit of, oh my gosh, I'm in Hollywood, it's the world of big movies, big television, and here am I, a Canadian. Were you carried along on that? I movie? like that because, in fact, uh, I had an interest in the history of Hollywood from the time I was a child, I guess. I'd go to a movie and I'd come back and go into the house as a different person every time. <laughs> My mother never knew who was coming through the door. James Cagney or Humphrey Bogart or, you know, <laughs> I, <laughs> I did them all. Um, and I really cherished, cherished it. And if you and I were sitting watching old black and white movies now, no matter how far back they go, I can tell you the people. I can tell you most of their names. Uh -huh. uh, supporting players and various... Uh, Perry Rosemond, Perry Rosemond, my longest friend from Winnipeg, he and I were watching Grapes of, Grapes of Wrath. Uh, is that it? Grapes of Wrath? Yeah. 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 In an old black and white studio or er, screen down in the in the uh, frat house and uh, there was this horse and I think a shadow was coming up. I said, here comes O.Z. Whitehead. And Perry said, that's a lie, it can't be O.Z. Whitehead. Who is that person? You're making this up. No, I just happened to know and that was my education from the time I was a child with film. So you learned, you learned the art of acting, not only the one, two, three method, but also by m mimicking what you saw on movies. Oh yes, oh yes. I'd walk the streets of the small town, singing up a storm after an L. Jolson thing or somebody else, you know, always doing something. And they thought, you know, they, they, they made room for me. They were not sure about me. So you were there four or five years? Yeah. And then you went back and forth for a number of years? No, it was during that. During that you were During the five. Forth. A year or six years. Yeah. And when did you finally, not abandon, but root back? I here? gave it up because, to be honest, I felt you can use up a lot of time here. The good material, you'd you'd luck out if you got the best material in town or any good material. The bigger stars were coming from the movies going into television, so the things that came around were not really my idea of where I, where I wanted to go. So it was a bit, um, that could have lasted forever. I remember the health club, the health club on, in Encino were filled with actors with old faces and young bodies waiting for the phone still, waiting, waiting, you know, and um, not having, not having uh, gone on with anything else, just simply were these aging actors. I took a lesson from that. I thought, no, you know, I can, uh, so I didn't appreciate LA as much. Um, I had these, I had these agents, but I needed to, to get moving on my own career. So I started to write. When I started to write, I came back to where I wanted to work, and this was it. So the Dream Factory never really put its tentacles no. into you. But I loved, I loved Hollywood, for my own reasons. When people would complain, there's not much here, I would say, oh no, there's lots here. The sidewalks are filled, you know, with careers that have gone well or not well, or, you know, this, the history has just seeped, you know, just oozing out of this place. And it killed me too. I mean, I loved seeing Al Jolson's tomb or going to the graveyards and doing all that stuff. I mean, all that was fine, but I, that was just a kid in me who was just simply, I, I got made up by one of the, um, uh, the family, the makeup family in the Universal. And up on the shelves were the plaster, plaster heads of uh, Bogart and oh all these other people done by that family. Wow. I forget their names now, wow. not awful. They were a very popular, very uh, famous family. But uh, I don't know, things of that nature, I fell right into it. It felt as though it was a hometown with me again. It was, it's like in like New York, same feeling I get in New York. 
step out of a hotel for the first day and feel I could be at home here, in a sense. So there was always part of me that had that strange ambition that uh, if had things worked out, you can have the best of all possible worlds with two countries, you know. Mm -hmm. And I think others have found success in that thinking. Shatner does it, yep. you know. But Sutherland, Shatner, those kind of... Chris is doing it now. I mean, Chris, he's an awful lot of stuff. they live down there. They, they, stay they live there. down there. I they don't, live down there. I'm trying to think of who uh, Nick Mancuso's tried, Saul Rubinick's tried to actually live here and work both sides, and yeah. it's never seemed to catch. No. Though it seems to be a constant ambition to try to live here and work both sides. That's right. Exactly right. You know. They, uh, they, like to, they like you living around the corner, so they can just call and say, yeah. let's go. Let's go see about this or that or whatever. But by the time you, you fly there and so on and uh, catch up with what's going on, it's not uh, not easy. You know that image of a gym full of aging actors with old faces and young bodies. My God. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> yeah, I know, I know, and you can see yourself, you know, kind of going that way. <laughs>